Hey folks, Veet here. Just jumping in here before the episode to let you know that you can contact us via email at inonesken at gmail.com. All one word, no apostrophes, I-N-O-N-E-S-K-E-N at gmail.com. Also, you can find us on social media. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Just search for In One's Ken. So if you want to reach out to us, leave us feedback, have a question, or even make a show suggestion, you can find us and we would love to hear from you. Remember, you can find our show on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher and TuneIn Radio, and for our US and Canadian listeners, on Google Play Music. And lastly, you can also find us on YouTube. Plenty of ways to find us and listen to our show, folks. Speaking of shows, on with this one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 210 of In One's Can, the internet podcast the NSA has been unsuccessfully assassinating. What? what? <laughs> well, they're Wait, listening. you guys listening. didn't have attempts on your lives by <laughs> shadowy men and black vans? Was that just me? Yeah, it could be was, just you. Was that what the guy was trying to do when he offered me that lollipop and I refused? No. I, yeah, man, it had, it had Saris and gas in it. <laughs> I how was many, like, no, nah, man. Nah. How many licks to the center of a neurologically destroying gas. <laughs> right. uh, how have you guys been, V? How have you been? Uh, good, mate. Good, good. How about you, Robert? You still alive? I don't know, man. This lollipop is scary now. <laughs> <laughs> don't eat it. Don't eat it. So I'm just going to jump into it. Uh, in, in the time since the last episode, some cool stuff has happened. And it's completely like superficial and doesn't matter in the grand scream. But Netflix Castlevania, I enjoyed a good bit. It's <laughs> only four episodes, but I actually enjoyed it. And I want to see more. And outside of that, I really enjoyed Edgar Wright's Baby Driver. Oh, that's good. I have yet to see it. I intend to, though. It's on my to-do list. Yeah, it it's crazy because it it's Edgar Wright but he's by himself. There's no collaboration with like a Nick Frost or a Simon Pegg helping him write. Yeah, it's, it's him that. flying on his own. And he even makes a callback to the last time he did something by himself by making the first scene of the movie a sh- almost shot-for-shot shot recreation of Mint Royale's Blue Song music video that Edgar Wright directed in 2003. Like, he completely recreates one of the first things he ever did as the first scene of the movie. Interesting. So it's him going, look, it's me by myself again. Let's pick this up. Because it's a callback to the fact that it's the the movie he's been wanting to make since he was 21. So he's starting from the point where he wanted to make the movie, and then he goes off from there. Right. Which is is really neat. Is it an American production or a UK production? Uh... It's very American. Yeah, it's very American. Okay. Yeah. It, it's it, it's a car heist movie, but Edgar Wright took it and he synced it to the music that he picked. Even the gunshots in the movie are on the beat. Wow. It's phenomenal. It's him. He's not breaking any ground here from a kind of a storytelling part, but of course Edgar Wright in his cinematic genius is playing with the format of a film by having things like gunshots and car doors slamming and people walking to be in uh, time to the music. Like the second scene after he recreates the Blue Song video, he does another song of the main character walking somewhere. And if you pay attention, you just pay attention to the black background Everything's syncing up with the background, like graffiti on the wall, signs, storefronts. They're all referencing the lyrics of the song as they're happening in real time. It's very subtle and amazing. So, yeah, I I really like it. I I mean, some people are going to be like, this is weird. It's like a really long music video. I was like, yeah, but those chase scenes. Yeah, that's that. 
when you see Jamie Foxx and and I forgot the other the name of the main character main actor, but they're actually doing those driving scenes themselves. Like there are scenes where you see them driving the car where they're actually driving the car. So there's that too. And I like it. Cool. But then again, I'm an Edgar Wright fanboy. Yeah, that we know. <laughs> Unfortunately, I haven't seen um, Spider Man yet, which you think is that's like weird, right? I should have been there at the midnight showing. But I'm going to wait because this is the third freaking reboot of Spider Man. <laughs> I've, I've heard good things, very good things. So I'm looking forward to it. I have too. Yeah. I'm not going to get to it till tomorrow evening. Can I give you my assessment having seen it? Yep. Yeah, that's fine. Freaking perfect. Oh my God. There you go. It, it, is, it is the Spider Man I've always wanted to see. Flat out, no question about it. Uh, they finally did justice to the character in in that way that he encapsulates everything all at once that each of the other two series did independently. Kind of like in, in the first, well, in the first trilogy, uh, Peter Parker was very much a a nerd and an outcast. And he had, he had all of those, he had all of those character traits about what makes Peter Parker. So Peter Parker, except he wasn't funny. Right, he, like he just wasn't. Um, and then in the Amazing Spider-Man series, Peter Parker was really, really funny. Um, but as well as Andrew Garfield, I felt played Peter. He didn't encapsulate that sort of like here's the perpetual lovable loser. Like he's just too cool to be Peter. He's too much of a like a male model. <laughs> yeah, and I don't, I don't, he, I don't hold that he, against. I don't hold belongs. that against him. He belongs more on the cover of GQ than he does stuck to the side of a skyscraper. Sure, yeah, and like and and like I've said, I don't I don't hold it against him, but it didn't really fit. And now you come into this movie, and the character is both things finally simultaneously. The story that's built around it is easily the best one. I would even go so far as to say it's quite possibly the single best Marvel Cinematic Universe film. Holy crap! Uh, I've heard uh, I've heard that I've heard people make that comment as well. The Vulture is probably the best villain they've had. Okay. Yeah, it's it's there is almost nothing this movie does wrong. Holy uh, crap, dude! Um, does it go through the origin story again? No. Okay. Oh, good. No, so, like, this well, is um... this, this. We're getting to the point where it's like you should know who this character is by now. Let's move on. Okay. Well, let's see. No, that's what I wanted. This is a. This is a continuation of the Spider-Man we saw in Civil War. Yes, the movie actually oh, yeah, opens. Uh, it opens that way. Right, right, yeah. You know, not, not, not to go into spoilers, but I'm just saying, the first five minutes of the movie is basically a recap of him going to Germany to have the fight. In, that yeah, he has in Civil that's War. even in the trailers where he, he, like, you see him doing the selfie cam. Like, he has the camera, he's like, all right, I gotta go fight, I gotta go fight, I'll be right back. He's videotaping right. it. I'm going in the trailers. Yeah, it's really funny. It's really, really funny. Um, and the movie is paced like a monster. I mean, it is so fast. It is quick-witted. Tons of story gets crammed into that two hours, 10-minute runtime. Um, and it has absolutely, unquestionably, the single best post credit stinger of all of them. Oh, man. Come on. Oh, wow. I'm not kidding. This movie is amazing. Okay. I, you have to go. I'm going to see it so many times. Because it's... No, no, really. James, you it's and I Spider-Man. should take a bet and, and put down a number. Like, how many times will Robert see the movie in the next two weeks? Uh, it's going to be less than Jurassic Park. You think? Oh, yeah. Mm, yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to say... Don't, you don't understand I'm the say, nerds that is Jurassic Park. <laughs> All right. So, on the top end, I'm going to say five times. All right. Um... So he saw Jurassic Park 11 in the first couple of weeks. I'm going to go with uh, about seven. Yeah, we'll see. Now I'm going to, I'm going to purposely do it wrong now. <laughs> <laughs> You'll go six go right three. down the middle. <laughs> yeah, you gave, you gave me that window. No, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's really good. Um, like I said, it's almost perfect. There is something that the movie does that is absurdly wrong that I will point out later because of our okay. topic. Um, it has nothing to do with the movie itself. It's it's literally a clerical error. Oh, okay. And it's one of those things. It's one of those things, though, that when you're watching the movie, you go, "No," but it doesn't affect anything, so you move on. Um, it's good times, though. 
yeah definitely encourage it um everyone needs to go see it because even um my brother went with me and one of the things that my brother and i really butt heads about is he doesn't like spider-man at all and the reason he doesn't like spider-man is because his opinion of spider-man is based pretty much only on the cinematic versions that have come before so when this movie happened and we saw it together and i was just i was losing my mind out of how this is the spider-man i've always wanted and he the movie was over and he was like that was just a really good film like he was he was he was like that was amazing yeah and he does not like spider-man but now he does and he was like i'm kind of scared <laughs> yeah coming from him that's high praise like he likes two things talking crap and lifting weights so and football 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 this is the guy who was our fury warrior <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, it's like it's like you play World of Warcraft. No, gotta top the meters. Gotta top the meters. You know who does play World of Warcraft? Spider Man. Yeah. Hawkeye asked him. Said, "Does anybody know about sneaking into places?" And he says, "I have a level twenty three rogue in World of Warcraft." <laughs> yeah. uh, um, and that was kind of what I've done with my week. So I guess kind of just taking over here. Um. I did finally, for like the first time in a year and a half, because of the way my schedule's worked out, I went to go play in a, in a Magic pre-release today, which was excellent. I love that game. Good set. Um, Going to go again tomorrow at the time of this recording. And um, Blizzard unveiled the D.Va statue for Overwatch, which is a $450 19-inch tall monstrosity that's as nice. wide. It's as wide as the other statues are tall, and I totally bought that shit. For the tune of like 480 bucks. Yep. Oh no, more than that. My state tax is online transactions. Oof. Oh man. And oh yeah. Well, free shipping because it's Blizzard oh, over 100 bucks. Yeah, 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 sure. Okay. Because Blizzard's awesome like that. But I was actually I took out a ruler and I was measuring places. Like I don't actually have room to put it <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> it's so big. He's gonna <laughs> sleep on the floor and she's gonna sleep in his bed. Hey, hey, yep, there you go. So big. Um, but yeah, no, I. Diva's Diva's my character in Overwatch. It's like I'm I'm a huge fan of a lot of the characters. I mean I love Tracer to death. I think she's great. Um, big fan of McCree, but Diva, <clears throat> Diva just does it for me. She's so great, and she's got the robot and everything, and the whole gamer thing. And then there's also like the online thing where she's all like Doritos and Mountain Dew. So whatever, <laughs> it's hilarious. I love it. So that statue was a no-brainer. I've been waiting for them to announce that statue. I was surprised because she's the biggest character in the game with her robot, and they kept her to scale with the other statues. <laughs> so she's huge. I was not expecting that. I guess I should have, though, considering. But yeah, um, that's pretty much it, though. Just me spending money. Lots and lots of money. Yep. I, I had the opportunity to go to that pre-release, and I was like, no, i got to do the podcast. <laughs> I've already warned Robert this this ha- this better be an amazing episode. <laughs> <laughs> Pressure's on. So yeah, just before we do go on with the episode, uh, since the last episode, um, I got the opportunity to go see West Side Story, which I actually mentioned, um, and I just want to say I had an absolute blast. Uh, it was everything I wanted and more. Uh, the choreography was just brilliant just can't speak out how wonderful the choreography was i did notice something as i was watching this production um there's a real demarcation and it happened i want to say late 70s early 80s when musicals changed the style changed and that's when in the late 70s and 80s um uh tim rice and andrew lloyd webber took over and became the new big thing in musicals as opposed to Stephen Sondheim and Leonard Bernstein. Um, so West Side Stories, you know, h- h- hinges on the choreography being more ballet-like, uh, the music being more orchestral. Um, so there's quite a difference, but it was just like I said, it was just everything I wanted and more. I had a blast. I sat there uh, mouthing all the words to the lyrics and all the lines. And when Lieutenant Shrank came on, which is the character I played in my school production, um, you know, I was just 
sort of mouthed all those words again. Hopefully I didn't say anything too loud that annoyed the person next to me. But yeah, I just had a blast. So what is our episode? Our episode is um, actually in a strange way uh, encompassing that and so much more and why I love and hate shared universes. Um, So real quickly, I need to lay out before we have this conversation, what is a shared universe um, as far as I am concerned? And a shared universe is effectively any body of stories that run separately that exist within the same space. So as I mentioned in last week's episode, I was talking about this, something like happy days of all TV shows is a shared universe because it has multiple spinoffs that ran simultaneously. So they all take place in the same world, but they're all telling different stories and they need not actually cross over with one another. That is not a requirement, but they exist within that same continuity. So yeah, Mork and Mindy and the Fonz totally happen in the same place. It's a very strange thing to consider, but it's true. Um, On the other hand, something that would not be a shared universe would be something like, the Matrix films, which even though there's a whole bunch of comic books and there's a series of mini stories and all that stuff, they all exist to tell one story. They do not happen simultaneously. And they only they only serve to lead up to the one event, if that makes sense. Um, so like you have the short movie uh, Final Flight of the Osiris. That's effectively a prequel to The Matrix Reloaded. Doesn't count. Do you see what I'm getting at? Sure. Okay. So the other thing is that there's two types of shared universes. Um, one is single writer and multiple writers. Um, a single writer shared universe would be something like what Stephen King does. Shockingly enough, um, there are lots and lots of hints in all of his books that they all actually share a a same setting um and it may not actually be a singular setting it might be a multiverse of parallel realities that interact with one another um various times especially in the dark tower series some of the monsters and creatures that are described and interacted with are actually things that have been in his other books the writer himself actually shows up as a character at one point um so that's interesting because he himself by by himself is just making up this whole shared universe so basically every single book takes place in its own reality but they share monsters they share themes they share things that travel to and from them in other stories that are part of that same sort of multiversal reality um and then the shared writers one would be quite easily the two most famous ones which are the DC Comics Universe and the Marvel Comics Universe, which are hundreds of stories being written simultaneously by dozens of people. This causes problems. Lots and lots and lots of problems. Um, But basically, that's what I'm looking for, is talking about these shared universes, why I think they're great, why I think it's really neat that these things can exist, um, some of the ones that I really like and don't like, and also problems I have with them. So... um, Real quick before I jump in there, do you guys have any sh- shared universes that you know of? And it can even just be, you know, Marvel, DC, whatever. Um, but, like, which are there any that you really follow intently that you're really into? Because I haven't asked that. Hmm. I don't actually know. And while you answer that question, I'm going to go feed my cat. There you go. What? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go first. Um, so I've been... I've finally got around to watching uh, Jessica Jones, and I'm halfway through... Luke Cage at the moment and while it's still all within the greater uh, MC universe I've just been enjoying this little subgroup this little side group of the MCU Um, and I I like and, and some of the connections you see are quite big and in your face and some of them are more subtle um and i've just been enjoying that and um another one that i have always enjoyed was and we robert did a whole episode on this was the 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 dc animated universe that whole batman superman uh justice league justice league unlimited i was a, a big fan of that as well everyone leaves out batman beyond 
and Batman Beyond. I actually didn't watch Batman. Thank you. Beyond, but that's all right. No, you're right. It was in the it was in the same universe. But that was another one I enjoyed a lot. It's my favorite part. I like the uh Star Wars universe. I mean, you can't talk about universes without that. And the one that got retconned right out. Uh, kind of, sort of, not all completely. It's according to how Disney feels when they decide to make something. Mm. Yeah. But, that, but that's a good point, though, because that's actually... Um, that actually kind of falls into the multiple writers category because you have a whole bunch of people making a universe and then somebody else got control of it and they were like, I have a different idea. My it idea is, is to make yours not happen. <laughs> it's okay. Chewbacca didn't get killed by getting hit by a moon. Yeah. That's all that matters. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, no, I... Oh, gosh. I used to know... I don't know what they're up to nowadays, but I used to know a lot of guys who, like, the Star Wars Expanded Universe novels, like, that was their lifeblood. Like, that was how they got more Star Wars. Yeah. And yeah. for 30 years, those books were all that mattered. And then Disney buys Lucasfilms, just like, hey, you know what? We don't care. It's all... None of it happened. It's like, oh, I, well, I, it's, I still it, can't it, fathom that. I can't fathom being somebody that invested in something for three decades and then having another company just be like, no. Well, I mean, it it happens. Uh, DC Comics did the new 52 where they were like, no, we're rebooting. None of that yeah. other stuff counts. Yeah, I'm bringing that up later. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that goes with what we're talking about being restarted. Like, So it, it's not it's not its own precedent. But no. uh, I I like the Young Jedi Knights a lot <laughs> when I was younger. I freaking loved the Young Jedi Knights novels. I, until... I really liked the Rogue Squadron books too. Yeah, Rogue Squadron too. They they were all super cool. Like, how, what what else are you gonna do? It's it's a whole universe, and nobody else is taking advantage of it. I like when stuff like that kind of increases the depth of a fictional universe. Yeah, and I, I think that stuff is fun, um, and you know some of them, some of them too are, like they they have like these little offshoots, but I don't really think they count as a shared universe. Like for example, the Walking Dead comic book, um, on occasion will do like these one shot stories that are somewhere else. Uh, there's a one issue little thing done that deals with the fact that Rick Grimes has a brother. He gets mentioned one time in the book and you never in the in the actual book you never find anything about him and then there's just this little one shot it's like okay yeah here's what happened to rick grimes his brother because we mentioned that you know but i don't really know i don't really think that qualifies as a shared universe because it doesn't it doesn't exist to stand on its own right it's not it's not there to keep going and to exist and and propagate and go forward it was just done to you know fulfill somebody's curiosity you know and in and in that same way like my favorite shared universe as a result of it being my favorite TV show barely gets a pass in that sense because for three years, Stargate SG-1 and Stargate Atlantis ran side by side and had nothing to do with each other, except for a couple of plots, um, but barely. Other than that, you know. Uh, the only other kind of shared universe that I ever took any interest in is in Final Fantasy with um, Final Fantasy Tactics, Final Fantasy Twelve, and... Yeah. Uh, why did I just forget the name of the game? Valkyrie, not Chronicles, Project. It was a PlayStation 1 game. Like, a lot of people didn't realize that it took place in Ivalis. Like, yeah, I know what you're, I know what you're talking about, yeah. Yeah, I own it. I just can't remember its name right now. But, yeah, that's all, like, they're all in Ivalis, and it's super cool. Cause yeah, I really like that one. A really neat little medieval world. Do you remember when, when they were all, like, there will be no other Final Fantasy settings aside from Evilus. And that, that promise lasted for all of like two years. That was a, that was a weird time. I was like, we're, we're going to have bunny girls forever now? Okay. Not that I have anything against it. Yeah. But that was a weird day. Yeah, no. Um, so, kind of talking about just these things. Let's jump right into uh, what I was talking about was this Spider-Man movie. Uh, so this Spider-Man movie has a giant continuity snarl and this is the problem with having multiple writers and multiple people doing a shared universe so you've had you've had the marvel cinematic universe which i would actually put forward right now is probably the singular most famous shared universe right now 
It's by far the most financially solvent. Um, you, you, know, you have all of these different characters. You have the Guardians of the Galaxy, who, to an extent, have not interacted at all with any of these other characters. And yet they find one of the Infinity Stones that's going to be incredibly critical to Avengers 3 coming out next year. Um, when they started filming Avengers, for example, the first uh, shot that they took that they shared with the fans were like, hey, it's the first day of filming. And what was the first day of filming? It was Tom Holland, Spider-Man, Chris Pratt, Star-Lord, and Robert Downey Jr., Iron Man, all standing next to each other saying, hey guys, we're doing it. So it's all going to come together for Avengers 3. But in the meantime, you know, Thor is his own movies. Iron Man's been his own trilogy. Yeah, yeah, Spider-Man now has just started. He's about to have a trilogy. And he's going to be in Avengers 3. And he was in Civil War. You know, you've got Captain America with his own movies. Yet yeah, the Hulk had one movie. It wasn't very good, but the Hulk had one movie. And this all started in 2008. Ten years ago. The funny thing about that is when you consider the timeline of all this stuff, it hasn't been eight years in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. One of the things that's kind of funny about um, Guardians of the Galaxy 2, and I can't remember um, exactly what it was that tipped me off to this. I think it was the 35 years later clause and what year they said at the beginning. But it, it clearly takes place in 2015. That movie takes place in the year 2015. Um, and... At one point, it was confirmed by Marvel that the time between Iron Man 1 and Avengers 1 was about four months. So Iron Man, Iron Man 2, uh, Hulk, Captain America, and Thor all took place within the scope of four months. Even though there had been like almost three years between all five of those movies. Yeah, so, you know, the timeline's a little weird, right? And that would be kind of difficult to uh, keep track of. And all it takes is one little clerical error and you make a mistake. And the mistake finally happens with Spider-Man, which is the movie insists emphatically that the Battle of New York happened eight years ago, which is, which is impossible. Wow. It's literally impossible. Yeah, you, you already see the problem, right? Because Avengers 1 came out in like, what, 2012? Yep. Yeah, that's not even five years ago. <laughs> and and yet you have all these other movies that come out between those. And, and, and like it, it is a giant mess. It's a, con it's a continuity snarl. And it's because somebody just made a mistake somewhere and no one caught it. Because they're juggling too many balls. And there's too many different writers. And there's too many different teams. And there's too many blah, 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 blah. But they're all trying to tell the same universal story. And so they make this huge mistake. This all happened eight years ago. That's impossible absolutely impossible um and yet this battle of new york and all that other stuff for eight years the eight years eight years eight years is referenced throughout the entire movie constantly so like when i said it was nearly perfect that is the problem that problem is is pretty glaring uh does it hurt the movie no but it it is one of those things where if you're really nitpicky you're just kind of like grabbing a brick and smashing against your head because it doesn't, doesn't, it's like, does not compute, does not compute. It's, it's been, I think in their timeline, it's been about three years since Iron Man was in their timeline. And so for, so for Spider-Man to just suddenly insist it's been almost three times as long, it's like, whoa, <laughs> what, what's happening, guys? What did you do? So, so that's you, a little. So you think, you think, do you think like absolutely nobody picked up on it or they just said, well, we've done it now. We're just going to go with it. I don't think they picked up on it. I, I think they got themselves confused. Okay. I, I, I think somebody, somebody somewhere made a, made a commentary about how long the movie universe has been going on. And that's what they ran with when they were writing it. Cause when they were writing it, that they, they were writing it like two years ago. So it would have been, you know, it would have been, hey, you know, eight years ago, even though it's more been like 10, but eight years ago, we had the Battle of New York when the cinematic universe started. And it's like, um, no, you know, so somebody screwed up somewhere. Um, yeah. And then continuing on with Spider-Man, um, Spider-Man is another example of why um, cinematic universes are, or just actually shared universes in general are really strange because you're really enjoying all these different stories, right? Like you just mentioned, uh, you really enjoy Jessica Jones and Luke Cage and all that. Um, I really, I've enjoyed Daredevil. I haven't actually 
Um, I know this is going to sound bizarre because I enjoyed Daredevil a lot. I haven't had the time to really sit down and watch uh, Jessica Jones or Luke Cage or Iron Fist, and I totally intend to, but I haven't gotten around to it. Um, and it's weird that there's now like three different versions of the Marvel Cinematic Universe happening simultaneously, and one of it is actually split into two. So let me explain what I mean by that. You have the Netflix universe, which is the Defenders. It's the ground level Hell's Kitchen street level yeah. New York. Um, Daredevil, Luke Cage, Iron Fist, Jessica Jones, who's a, a recently new character, actually. And they're all going to come together and form the Defenders. These characters have never once been mentioned in any of the Marvel Cinematic movies, including Spider-Man, which is awkward because he's in Queens um, and is a very much a ground level character. Um, but yeah, so these characters are not mentioned. Simultaneously, there's the Marvel uh, television series that are happening. Agents yeah, of such Sh- as the Shield, yeah, and the Inhumans. Yeah, a- Agents of Shield has been going on now for four years. I really like that show, but it's never been referenced by any of the TV, sh- by any of the movies, except maybe once by Nick Fury during Avengers Two, absurdly off to the side. Um, and then you have the fact that none of the movies have mentioned, like none of the movies have mentioned that the Netflix shows have not mentioned that they have not mentioned the Netflix shows. So you've got like these three different versions of it running simultaneously and none of them have anything to do with each other, except for the fact that they all apparently share the same space and the movie stories affect them. Um, for example, the battle of New York, which apparently was eight years ago is the entire reason that the Kingpin rises to power in daredevil. Right. Right. He, he, he helps, um, he helps take over a lot of the businesses that are doing the reconstruction effort. And that's how he starts to accomplish, you know, just secure all of his power and get all that running up and down. So it's tied, it's tied directly to Avengers. And then of course the TV universe with, you know, agent fricking Phil Coulson, who is a great character. I mean, the guy was in like the first several movies. He is clearly uh, the glue of the first part of the cinematic universe. And he continues to exist in this television show. And yet nobody knows and nobody pays attention to it. Nobody comments on it if they do know and, you know, and vice versa, which is very strange. And it's why I kind of get a little concerned because I'm like, so are they just leaving themselves like a giant out? Are they going to at any point if they need to just say, Hey, the movies are going to do something. So the TV show just doesn't exist now. Hmm. Interesting. Cause you're right. The connection does exist, but it's, in one direction only it's the right netflix and the tv will mention the big green guy the ca- captain um the incident in new york but it's not the opposite way the movies never refer to back to the the tv or the netflix series and that's another thing do they ever reference them by name or just by description yes, that's true they do actually um they do uh, both but yeah, like they talk about the Hulk being in there. And there were a few times... Actually, no, now I think about it, I think you might be right. I think it's mostly by description. But the character likenesses are clearly there. Yeah. Um, at one yeah. point, at one point, Daisy, who is Quake, um, a character from the comics. I mean, because they're all, they're all characters from the Marvel comics. I mean, they're all canon. Um, but Daisy gets put into a cabin that S.H.I.E.L.D. owns out in the woods. And this cabin looks like it's made out of wood. But then you can pull back the wood paneling. And there's just these gigantic gigantic metal steel walls and, and like they have these giant fists imprinted in them it's like what'd you do well we used to put the hulk in here you know and, and it's it's like there's this direct connection right and yet they don't they're never allowed to actually interact and for a lot of people who are fans of um agents of shield like i am it's maddening yep and and mind you let me just caveat that i'm a fan of agents of shield because i love the characters i don't actually think it's all that well made of a show right but sure but the yeah, but I mean, like the the fight scenes are lame. Um, a lot of the special effects are failures. Some of the individual episode plots are kind of like, oh god, what are you doing? Um, but on a whole, the series itself is very well written. You never actually know what's going to happen. It's one of the few shows that genuinely does surprise me. Um, and like I said, the characters are great. I really enjoy watching the characters. Uh, go Fritz. Um, so you know, it's good stuff. I really enjoy it, and I just wish the movies would care. It also does some weird stuff um, to the TV shows because they're beholden to the movies. Um, and my favorite example of this is the first couple of seasons of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, in season one of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., they don't really do a lot with the series for the first like 18 episodes. It's kind of funny. Um, 
it starts to get better near the halfway point as they start to near the release of Captain America's um, Winter Soldier. So you have this weird moment where you have, I think it's like episode 16 or 18. I can't remember which how many episodes there are all right now. Wow, whatever. Um, but you get to like this 16th or 18th episode of the series and everything's been leading up to this big reveal, this big moment, right? There, somebody's a traitor. They don't know who. They don't know what's going on. Something's wrong. So you watch the movie that Tuesday. Well, sorry, you watch the TV show that Tuesday. That Friday of the same week, Captain America Civil War comes out. You find out, oh man, Hydra has infiltrated S.H.I.E.L.D. They've been in S.H.I.E.L.D. for like the last 70 years. S.H.I.E.L.D.'s damn near evil, right? And this whole civil war breaks out between um, the, two, the two halves, the good S.H.I.E.L.D. agents and the Hydra agents, and they fight, and that's what that whole movie's about, and it's crazy. And then if you're watching it, you're going, but, but what about the TV show? Next week on Tuesday, five days later, you watch the TV show, and oh my god, half of S.H.I.E.L.D. is evil, and the show is amazing for the next six episodes as they basically deal with the fallout of that movie. But that's very weird. Because there's suddenly a huge plot twist that doesn't happen in the TV show. They are made aware of it, and then they have to deal with it. And again, the movie influences the TV show. So like for the next year and a half, the next, uh, sorry, the next season and a half, um, they spend time in the TV show mopping up all of these Hydra agents. Like, it doesn't just go away cleanly like it does in the movies. They keep dealing with it in the TV show universe. They keep, they keep having to deal with all these things. And then the mother of all what the F moments happens for television. And that's the second season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Um, this is kind of spoilery, but whatever. Um, so a lot of the crux of the latter half of the second season comes down to the fact that there are two S.H.I.E.L.D. agencies. Because S.H.I.E.L.D. is all cloak and daggery, um, there's Coulson's S.H.I.E.L.D., and then there's another shield. And both sides think that the other shield is evil for various reasons. Although Coulson mostly is just confused. He's like, what the heck? And the other shield is like, you're not the real shield. We are. And they, they fight. Um, because they don't trust one another because of all the Black Dagger espionage stuff and the fact that they were all working independently as cells and that only Nick Fury was really in contact with any of them. And he's been MIA since um, Winter Soldier. And then Avengers 2 comes out. And the backtrack a little bit. The problem with Coulson is Coulson can't tell anybody what he's doing. He spends the entire season, and I mean the entire season, keeping a deep, deep secret that he will not tell anybody, even his own team. And this keeps causing the other shield to think that Coulson is evil and up to something. Then the final episode of that of that arc happens, where they're about to get into a big fight. Avengers Age of Ultron comes out. And what happens? A helicarrier rises up in the finale, and Nick Fury's on board, right? And they save all the people on Sokovia. That's cool. Then you go to the television show. The big secret was that Coulson was keeping that mothballed in case Fury needed it one day. Coulson was protecting the helicarrier, and he wasn't allowed to tell anybody else. So once the helicarrier is revealed, and Coulson says, that was my big secret, the other shield goes, oh, we're both good guys. And they basically shake hands, and it's done. <laughs> The entire conflict is resolved off screen in another movie that's not about them. And when you watch those two episodes back to back on the DVD box set, like I have it, you're like, whoa, what happened? I missed something because you did. It's really weird. And that's that's part of the problem with shared universes. Like as much as I enjoy a shared universe, because oh boy, do I enjoy a shared universe. You have weird stuff like that yeah. where you have... You have people trying to tell these multiple stories and just because of the physics of it, it doesn't work. You want to know something clean. funny? Yeah, go for it. This problem exists in the comic books too. Because yes, it does. A majority of the comic books, it'll be like, it'll be like, hey, uh, I'll beat you like I did the first time. It's like, asterisk, check out issue 217 of X-Men or... Of you totally episodes up what I was four talk of about. it's like, how many comic books do I have to read to get to know what's going on? Yeah, like, yeah. Editor's note: see issue number twenty-seven from three years ago. Yeah, totally. And I was yeah. like, really? And it made it really hard for me to get back into comics because, you know, when we had the Superior Spider-Man, mm. like it was just constantly full of 
like telling me to go read comic books that are from years ago. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't do this. I'm just going to have to be in the dark about these things. Pretty much. And Superior Spider-Man was an interesting thing too. Um, yeah, so that's a big continuity snarl. I mean, not continuity snarl, but just like it makes continuity difficult because those are separate teams. One of those things that's kind of funny, and I don't know if it's thought or not, but uh, there used to be a lot of uh, hostility between the TV show team and the movie team. Like they, they, the, I think the movie team saw the TV team as a threat to them. Um, behind, like behind the scenes stuff, like you know who's going to climb up the ladder, right? You know? um, which is why a lot of people actually think that uh, Captain America. The Winter Soldier was a deliberate attempt to sabotage the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. TV show. Um, and they just persevered despite it. So, yeah, whatever. Um, you, but you've got weird things like that going on. And then you have the Spider-Man problem. Um, not the continuity snarl, but the fact that he's not owned by the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, he, he's owned by yeah. Sony. Um, so this gets interesting. Um, Sony, as we all know, and we've talked about before, it was actually our second episode, which almost became a Spider-Man episode by accident. Um, or was it our third episode? I think it was our third episode. Third episode. Yeah, third episode. Third. Um, yeah, third. Um, the Spider-Man universe was kicked off um, by Sam Raimi and Sony, and he set out to make a very 60s and 70s Spider-Man. And he was very successful at that. Um, the thing is, though, those movies were so good for Sony financially. Um, they made tons of movie. Even the third one, which was just a disaster artistically on many levels, um, made tons of bang. And Sony was not willing to let that go away. And, you know, Sam Raimi stepped away from making a part four for extensive reasons. And Sony decided that, you know what? We're just going to make another Spider-Man. <laughs> uh, enter the Amazing Spider-Man dilemma, where they literally make a Spider-Man movie like just soullessly like they've got a paint by, by committee. numbers yeah it's it's by committee it's got paint by numbers and they just start checking the boxes spider-man is this spider-man is that these are the characters these are the plots these are this yep. and it's just oh man and it's it's painful it's painful because i want to like it i i like i, said, I like the andrew garfield's portrayal yeah i liked andrew garfield's portrayal i liked that they started with gwen stacy they didn't just jump to mary jane which is actually one of the things i don't like about the trilogy um you know, there, there were a lot of things about it that felt better. They really did. But then there were also just tons and tons of problems. So many problems. They were obsessed with telling this story about his parents that was going nowhere. Um, they kept focusing on the wrong things. They they changed his whole relationship with Norman Osborn and Oscorp and Harry and all. It just, oh, Aunt May is like, there's that scene where Aunt May is like, I'm just, you know, I'm taking these night classes for nursing so that I can afford for you to go to school. I'm like, that's not how that works. You know, those night classes cost money too. So <laughs> if you dropped out of your classes, you would be able to pay for his school. It, the, the whole thing is just a disaster because they, they, they artificially try to make his life hard. They artificially generate villains for him. They artificially this, artificially that. It, it's just, you want to like it, but you can't. They still made a lot of money, but they didn't make as much money as they wanted. Um, and then there was a little awkward little side project that they were they were doing. Sony was trying really hard to get the Amazing Spider-Man franchise into the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Like, they wanted that. Um, and that's why uh, at the end of Amazing Spider-Man, when he's swinging through New York and he's trying to stop the lizard from turning everybody else into lizards um, at the top of Oscorp Tower, which is all just very strange... Um, the reason that he's swinging from one, um, I can't think what they're called all of a sudden. Crane, crane, crane. Crane, thank you. Wow. Right. Um, the reason he's swinging from crane to 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 crane and it's just cheesy as all hell and stupid is because they were trying to imply that this was them rebuilding after the Battle of New York against the Chitauri and Avengers. And they, they wanted very badly for... Um, the Avengers Tower to show up in the skyline shots of New York City. Like they were trying to get that deal put together and they didn't get it done in time, but they kept trying. They kept trying to do it. Um, and then they made Amazing Spider Man 2, which is a just gigantic mess of a movie. Genuinely dislike it. Uh, just awful. <laughs> Straight through. Um, even though it's the got video some cool game is too. 
<laughs> yeah, I've heard. Um, yeah, it's just it's just awful. It's just not a good thing. It's not a good thing at all. Uh, that just put the kibosh on the whole deal. They were like, nope, 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 nope. We're not doing this. Your Spider-Man is terrible. We're not bringing him into our universe. And somehow, some way, um, the stars aligned and they managed to come to an agreement, which required another reboot of Spider-Man, admittedly. Um, but having seen the movies, oh, I'm so glad that they did. Um, but what they did was they came to an agreement where Sony pushes the finances of all of his solo films. Like every time there's a Spider-Man solo movie, then Sony puts the money forward and Sony makes all the profits. Marvel, however, and I didn't know this until recently, Marvel has full creative control and the Marvel Studios team creates the plot and the movie and the casting and all that stuff. They have full creative control. Those people all get paid for their work. So like no one's getting screwed here. They all get paid for their work but Marvel Studios themselves don't make anything from the profit. Sony does. On the other hand, because he's part of their universe, Spider-Man now gets to be in Avengers 3. This makes Avengers 3 10 million thousand times better than it would have been without him, unquestionably. And as a result, they get the profit from having Spider-Man in Avengers 3. So this is an amazing deal. There's a dark side to it. Sony owns all the Spider-Man characters. And so on the side, Sony goes, hey, you know what we should totally do? What's that? We should have make movies with all of the other Spider-Man characters, like Venom. So there's going to be a, a movie about Venom coming out later, starring Tom Hardy. By characters, you mean the villains or? Yes, oh, yes, sorry. the okay. villains. Okay. Movies about the villains because they're the like. The Sinister like, Six. All, all of it, all of it. Okay. Now, the, the question I have about this, to what extent is the Marvel Cinematic Universe team involved? If they are then there's hope for it. If Sony's just doing it, then that's really going to be awkward. <sighs> exactly. Welcome to shared universes, folks. Yeah, and then on the flip side, you have the problem with Fantastic Four. Oh, and that's just a disaster. The CEO is so done with dealing... The CEO of Marvel so done with dealing with the rights to it. He's burning the franchise to the ground like he's literally like he's deleting them from existence he effectively has i own the story um and um like what's crazy is um so there's a marvel heroes mmo rpg yes made by david david brevik the the father of diablo and it has all the marvel characters in them well uh as of sometime this month you will no longer be able to purchase the Fantastic Four characters. Like he is removing the license from everyone. Yeah, it's 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 scorched earth. It's total scorched earth. And the the tricky, the weird thing is, it's on the Fantastic Four main protagonists. Somehow, Doom is his own thing. Doctor Doom. No, no, it's it's actually weirder than that. It's weirder than that. And this is this is like a okay, shared universes get weird, okay? Because there's the ultimate universe as well. And there was this story um called Secret War, which I own. Um it's a good story, but it's effectively the last Fantastic Four story. Um all of the multiverses of the Marvel Comics universes are crashing into each other and being destroyed. It's complicated, I'm not gonna get into it. Ultimately, Audrey's words, the final two universes that remain are the 616 comic book universe. These are the Marvel comics that you've been reading for like 40 years, right? Um, or longer than that, actually, a lot longer. Um, those, are, those are the main continuity. That's all your characters that you know and love. And then the other remaining universe is the Ultimate Universe, which was started by the Ultimate Spider-Man comics. And Ultimate Universe is effectively a, a reboot off to the side. So it's not a reboot of the entire franchise. They were like, you know what? These characters are all old. People who want to get into them have to buy hundreds, even thousands of issues of backstory if they want to have it all. Let's just start over. Over there. And we'll give new people a, a, their own universe. And so they created the Ultimate Universe, and I love it. I own every single Ultimate Spider-Man comic. I have them all. And, and trade paperback. I have every single part of it. Um, well, I should say I used to love it. Because they crashed it into the 616 universe and killed both of them. So both of the universes ended. 
And the only reason that they were saved is because Dr. Doom went and became God Doom. He defeated the Eternals with the help of Dr. Strange and, and the Molecular Man, which complicated, I'm not getting into it. Um, he became God, like literal God. Like he can kill Thanos in one punch God. And he recreated the world as best he could as a sort of battle planet that was home to all of the different like story arcs. It, got, it, got, it was really weird. I'm not getting into it. It's just stupidly weird. But the crux of the story is Dr. Doom and Reed Richards getting into an argument over who could do this better. Because Molecular Man is the, is, the, is the reason that Doom is basically God. He's able to give you all this omnipotent power. And in the midst of the argument, Reed goes, admit it, I could have done a better job. And Doom goes, yeah, yeah, you could have. And then Reed goes, oh, well, since we're both in agreement. And then Molecular Man takes away all of his godlike power, gives it to Reed Richards, and effectively makes the Fantastic Four family the gods of the Marvel Universe because they recreate the multiverse. Because Reed will do a better job, and he does. But this also means that Reed Richards and the other members of the Fantastic Four are now off in some sort of pseudo-reality where they just craft realities for themselves to then have their kids go explore. So they're just gone. They're just gone. It's like, it's not a bad ending if it's an ending for them. It's not bad at all. It's actually kind of cool. But they're gone. Because, and, and it's purely Disney. Disney's just like, you know what? Those guys will not give us those rights back. Burn the bridge. Salt the earth. Kill it all. So, yep. man, if you were a Fantastic Four fan, you're SOL right now. <laughs> yep. Last good thing you got out of them was that and the future foundations with Spider-Man. Yeah. and But like I said, it gets weird. Because as you mentioned, Doctor Doom gets to hang around still. Yep. And he's also kind of had a change of heart. Um, because, again, Reed Richards does it better, right? So Reed Richards goes, hey, you want to have a better outlook on life, Victor? I'll give that to you. And so he does. Um, so Victor is no longer pissed off and moody, and he's kind of a good and guy. Bitter tyrant. Yeah, he's he's really not bad. I mean, he's still kind of cruel, but he's not a bad guy. Oddly, oddly. Um, on the other hand, though, over in the Ultimate Universe, shenanigans went down. Um, Reed Richards and Sue Storm did not hook up. In fact, she dumped his butt over stupid stuff. It's a badly written story, um, and he takes it very badly and becomes evil and yeah um he somehow continues into this new universe as a bad guy called the maker and he is absolutely because he is just a very evil reed richards he's as smart as the original reed richards was flat out hands down the most dangerous guy in the universe that is what they did to the fantastic four that is bonkers how does this happen you know that is weird that is weird stuff that's strange but even then, if you want that story to make sense, not only have you had to have read 616 Marvel Universe, but you have to have read all the Ultimate stuff. And the Ultimate stuff went to hell fast. Um, like I said, I'm a big fan of that. I was enjoying Ultimate Universe quite a lot. Um, Spider-Man was fantastic. I've met the writer, Brian Michael Bendis, who lives close by in Portland, Oregon, um, several times. Had a very long conversation with the man about the books and why I like them. And he's a great guy. Um, but... The stories are fantastic. Um, Peter Parker, uh, perpetually in high school, he's 15. I think he's 15 years old for like 120-something issues. He only has like a 16th birthday way into it. Um, and it was really fun. And then other people started writing in the Ultimate Universe. And, well, Ben this made Ultimate X-Men, which got a little weird because he made them way too powerful. Like, like, literally so powerful that I would kill them all. Like, without question. Um, at one point, uh, Bobby Drake, Iceman, gets angry and freezes the entirety of New York. You cannot allow someone like that to live. That's insane. Um, That's so he, what, that would have caused the Civil War. Yeah, so he, he starts way too... They're, they're way too powerful, and they start that way. And it, gets, it just gets worse when he steps down and other people start writing it. And, and the other thing, though, is that other people start writing it. So here's where you have, like, conflicting writers, okay? Other people get these ideas in their heads. And because the Ultimate Universe was not the actual universe, they were like, I can do whatever I want. I'm going to get really weird. Or I'm going to do something really stupid that I couldn't do before. Or I'm going to do this. Or I'm going to do that. And it got, oh, 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 gosh. Um, like, Jeff Loeb, 
for example, um, who's otherwise a rather great writer, got his hands in the Ultimate Universe and was like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write a storyline where Magneto gets Thor's hammer and just decides to kill everyone. Wait, how did he explain him being worthy? I don't care. <laughs> I just don't care. That's dumb. It's all dumb. All right, he kills, he, he combines his magnetism with Thor's hammer to kill Wolverine. He wipes him out down to the last molecule. He cannot regenerate. He's gone. He's dead. Um, he kills Professor Xavier. They kill a whole bunch of other characters. Um, they, he causes a tidal wave to crash over Manhattan, which breaks the Sanctum Sanctorium, and Dormammu comes out and kills Doctor Strange. Um, the Blob, who's a mutant at one point, grabs the Wasp and starts to eat her. So Ant-Man becomes Giant-Man and bites the Blob's head off. Um, because, you know, whatever. Why well, that's still not as weird as Onslaught, the resurrected giant of, soup, of Red Skull with the psychic powers of Professor X. So we're still in safe comic book territory here. No, it, it just, it got bad. Okay, it got really bad. And then, and then you want to talk about like weird stuff? Like th- this is where like it gets really contentious because people are like, oh, racial issues. But then, then it got really weird when um, they were doing the Amazing Spider-Man 2. They announced that. Not not 2, but like the Amazing Spider-Man movies after um, Sam Raimi decided not to make a part 4. And when they were announcing that, um, Donald Glover was like, I want to play Peter Parker. And oh, that just, God. yeah, that caused a shit storm on the internet. Because then there were a whole bunch of people who were just like, well, he should be allowed to play Peter Parker because he's not white. It's like, well, that got weird. No, no. No. Everybody also got to find out who in their family was racist. Yeah, it got, it <laughs> like got, got really weird. Like, it, he got death threats. It's like, if you accept, we will kill you. Yeah, no. It's like, like it, what it, the hell? Well, that's what I mean. But see, for, for me, it was like neither side was good here. I would like, love to have Donald Glover be Peter Parker. Like, I love Donald Glover's work. No, it's nothing, against, it's, like, it's nothing against him. It has nothing to do with... Like, with not him. only as an actor, but his childish Gambino, his rapper name, mm-hmm. he's great. And then, thankfully, they let him end up voicing Miles Morales. Right, but that's actually what I'm getting at. Is like this whole event where, like, literally, it got really bad on both sides very quickly. Um this whole event um, kind of makes Marvel go, well, I guess people really want a black Spider-Man. I have no problem with this. I really don't. What I have a problem with is when they decide we should totally kill Ultimate Peter Parker and replace him with this other guy. <laughs> I'm <laughs> The original Peter Parker. You threw away everything that I was reading, guys. <laughs> everything. Now, I like Miles. I like Miles and Rallies a lot. I bought all of his books. I have them all. He's a great character. I don't dislike him at all. But I I can't not look at it as just somebody just basically going, I really want Spider-Man to be black and just killing Peter Parker. I can't see it any other way because that's basically what happened. Um, and that's just really weird to me because I I don't know. Like even talking about this right now, I guarantee you there's somebody out there right now that's just like, oh my God, he's such a racist. No, I'm not. <laughs> it's just, this is so, it's such a weird saying because now you've got like all these conflicting things because somebody's like, well, I want this. So I'm going to get this. And everyone, other people are like me are like, but, but Peter Parker, I, 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 I bought the ticket for Peter Parker. It's why I'm here. Um, one of one of the things that like Marvel kept saying to justify the the, the change was they were like, well, you know, when, when Spider-Man puts on the mask, it could be anybody under there. It doesn't have to be Spider-Man. And I'm like, yeah, but I didn't like Ben Rowley. The, the only reason I'm here is because I like Peter Parker. Peter Parker is one of the greatest comic book characters I've ever come across. I love him. Like, seriously, he's a great guy. He is the coolest character ever. I don't... He's my favorite for a reason. Yes, he is my second favorite. Batman is my favorite, but he is my second favorite. And it's because he's Peter. It's not because he has web shooters or a cool costume or he's got or the coolest white. power. Yeah, I don't care about that. It's not because of any of these things. It's because he's Peter. And then you're just like, nope, he dies. Miles Morales, you're up. I'm like, oh, oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> Why? Um, so, yeah, that, that sucked for me. That was bad. <laughs> Going through that entire that entire thing was just a whirlwind of crap for me. Because I'm just I'm just in the standing in the center going, please don't. Oh geez. Um, now, mild, mild, mild spoiler for the movie. It's not it's not anything about the film story. I'm not seriously. I would not say it otherwise. Um, 
Donald Glover is in Spider-Man Homecoming. Yeah. He plays a character named Aaron Davis. Aaron Davis is the mm-hmm. Prowler. The Prowler is Miles Morales' his uncle. Oh, my. Oh, okay. So, Miles Morales confirmed Marvel Cinematic Universe. Off yeah. to the side. He's somewhere. <laughs> he is there. Okay? Yeah, because that's um, in, uh, isn't that in one of the trailers where it's like, a kid watching Spider-Man swing by and it's like, Miles, come on. He's like watching yeah. Spider-Man swing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's 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 a few things. Um, I'm not sure about that in the trailer. I don't remember seeing that, but um, but yeah, no, there's there's some interesting things going on there. So Miles does exist. Um and like I said, Donald Glover is in the movie, which is it's because like you said, he voiced Miles Morales in the cartoon. So, you know, there's there's this whole kind of roundabout thing going on because no one no one thinks he wouldn't do a good job. Yeah, you know, that's not that's not the thing. Um, I mean, if you really want to get into that discussion, you could talk about the whole. Um, uh, I can't think of her, her name. Zendaya. Zendaya. Where are you? Um, I can't think of her name right now. I'm tired. Um, but she, she's she's a she's an actress who's in the Spider-Man film. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, and I'm and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, say anything about it. I'm just gonna say that they did what I prefer. They did what I prefer, which is they didn't just take a character and do what, what they call in Hollywood anymore the race lift. They made a new character. Because I don't I don't care about like what characters exist. I don't I don't care about any of that kind of stuff. I just want you to tell the story. What gets weird to me is when you start changing characters. That to me is a little weird. Yeah, instead of like deleting one character like like it's comparing, say, if uh like when they when they feel obligated to make a Spider Man of like the the Indian Spider Man who's Petra, a cool character he's Petra, still around Petra Petakov instead uh like instead of doing that say making I don't know Static Shock who is an amazing superhero for DC love Static Static Shock is amazing he's unique he's he very is, unique he is the only him that there ever was he didn't replace anyone he's not a re reskin of some other superhero he's he's his own thing he's static shock yeah i have loved him since his inception in the 90s yeah and i really enjoy him too he's 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 a fantastic character i really really like him in the in the dc animated universe that v mentioned earlier he's great in that um but yeah he's he's his own brand new fresh character so like i don't i don't care what the characters are it's just like like i said last thing i'm going to say about this because like it gets in the weird places i'll just i'll just put it this way I have no problem with having a diverse roster of characters, but at the same time, it's also kind of like saying that it's bad to be white. It's weird. I don't want to go there. People keep pushing the issue though. You so, racist. I know, right? <laughs> like I said, it, it's a weird, it's a weird place to be. So I just, I like it when they do what they did in this movie. Like I said, this to me, to me, Spider-Man Homecoming is damn near perfect. Other look at the, it. Look at it like this on the opposite spectrum. You know what I hate just as equally when. Jake Gyllenhaal is the Prince of Persia. Yes. That makes me sick. That's awful. That was you so bad. You're stealing someone else's culture and representation because, oh, he's white. He'll sell more tickets. Yeah, that's what, that was bad. That was very, very bad. Also, it's garbage. Uh, yeah, Last Airbender, we're looking at you. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, whitewashing is just as bad. Yeah, like I said, it's, it's, not, it's not a racial thing for me. It's a character thing. To me, to me I... I can totally look at like the fifties and sixties and seventies and be like, yes, lots of white blonde characters. Oh God. They are products of their time. Get over it. Let's make some new ones. That's just how I see it. Um, you know, cause I mean, I'm all for, like I said, representation of everybody. I'm, I'm totally for this. I just think it's way cooler to make new characters. I really do make somebody who's a badass who's not just like a copy. Yeah. Cause that, 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 that to me is almost, I, I don't insulting know. Insulting to the group. It, yes, trying it's to insulting. Represent. It's insulting. It's like, oh, you can only aspire to be like the white character. Yeah, you get the sloppy <laughs> second rehash. Yeah, so like I said, that's that's the last thing I want to say on that because that gets a little awkward. But that's also part of you know shared universes because you have these you have all these different people with different agendas pushing their agendas into the shared space, and the shared space becomes very convoluted. For example, one more day, which we talked about before, and I'm not going to get all in, I'm not going to get all into how awful it is, and it's the most hated comic book arc ever because it ruins Peter Parker. Because Peter Parker makes a deal with the devil and tells God to go f off, which you know, regardless of how you feel religiously, that's amazing. 
that Peter Parker would do this? You mean you take that character and you drag him through the mud irreparably? Wow, thanks, Marvel. Good job. Why Why do this? Because Joe Quesada just thought he'd be more interesting if he wasn't married. Oh, is it probably because you're just an idiot? Um, but anyways, so let's say you take that issue. Joe Quesada wants this to happen very badly. He He so badly that he himself draws the book. Like, this is going to happen. He's the editor-in-chief. He's decided that Peter's not going to be married anymore, and he's going to use magic to just wash away decades of continuity. Just awful. Absolutely awful. You know what really takes a cake about all that? Peter Parker exists in the Marvel comic universe. He exists in a comic who, at that same moment, has Doctor Strange, who can literally, you know, bring up gods to help May if he wanted to. And hey, he owes Peter a few. You know, it's a gunshot wound to Aunt May. That's all it is. It's a gunshot wound. And you have Doctor Strange who can bring forth gods and omnipotence at will to help her. You have Reed Richards who could, I don't know, invent something to help her, maybe. And then, oh, hey, over there at the X-Men at this time, there was a character called Elixir. What's his entire power? He heals you. How does he heal you? He controls every cell in your body body and he could do it from a distance in fact at one point elixir healed a guy whose dude i mean this guy's heart the dude's heart is torn out okay and elixir from a distance fixes the guy he can't help at me wow you're gonna turn to mephisto the literal devil because you're trying so hard to make it work in your universe so hard and, and that becomes the other problem. You're going to tell these stories. And sometimes the only way to tell them is to ignore that the rest of the universe exists. Gotham City should not be a problem. The Joker should be dealt with. The Flash and Superman exist. I'm sorry, Batman. <laughs> <laughs> you're my favorite. Batman, you're my absolute favorite. But I'm sorry. <laughs> You've got nothing on these guys. I mean, and and even then, like DC, DC is a weird place because a lot of those characters grew uh, grew into existence individually in their own universes. So, like Marvel, almost from the get go, was a shared universe, like almost from the start. And it was because a lot of the exact same writers were making all the characters. You know, you had Ditko and Lee, and you know they were all just making the same dude. They're like, oh, let's make the Fantastic Four. Now let's make Spider Man. Now let's make the X Men. Now let's make this. And because they were writing all of them. They were like, oh, maybe the Hulk runs into Spider-Man. Why not? Yeah, let's do that. Hulk runs into Spider-Man. Okay, cool. Let's do that story. Sweet. You know, and they do that. And so from the get-go, that was, you know, very low power level, you know, because they all exist in the same playing field. And then you go to DC, and DC is a crazy place where you had Spider-Man. That's right. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I oh failed. Boy. Edit this. No. Um, we had Superman. Superman starts out, and he is so super that he can puff his cheeks and blow out a star. I'm not kidding. He can change his face by contorting his muscles. I mean, like, the oh, dude. Oh, God. Yeah. No, the dude is so powerful because he is the only hero, right? Like, all of his stories are about him being a total badass in any way they want because there's no one to compare him to. Over somewhere else, you've got Batman who's doing Batman stuff. And then you've got a psychologist who's really in the bondage creating Wonder Woman and she loses her powers when her bracelets get put together and she has an invisible jet because whatever. Thanks, oh, and she makes, created the Rorschach test. And yeah, and she makes constant references to um, lesbianism throughout. <laughs> we did not get the we did not get the original Wonder Woman in this in this movie that came out. I'm just saying. All right. <laughs> we did not. Um, and I am grateful for this. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I mean, like, that's a weird place. And then DC, what happens there is they start buying up all these individual characters, and then they start putting them together. So you have, and that's how you come up with, like, literal gods. Superman is so powerful. And then you have Batman. And then at the same time, these two are supposed to coexist. So Gotham City is a place full of normal human villains. Joker is not super powered. Harley Quinn is not super powered. Uh, you know, Mr. Freeze is a guy with a, with an ice gun. You know, they're not they're not super. They're crazy, and they have gimmicks. The Mad Hatter is that person. Um, 
Catwoman likes to steal things that dress like a cat, and Batman proposed to her last month because reasons. Um, you know, it's it's just things are happening over there, and the whole time it's like, but couldn't couldn't Superman or anybody else just come in and like fix all these problems for you? Like in a day, it'd be like that quick, man, that quick. It would be hilarious. Um, but no, there's some sort of unwritten rule where like Batman's like, stay out of my city. And they're like, okay, okay, well, we'll stay out of your city. And then, yeah, it's just weird. <laughs> they, they, they have to keep contriving reasons to keep them separate. And yet they share the same place. It's odd. And actually, a good example of where this gets weird, weird is when you go to, say, um, Batman vs. Superman, Dawn of Justice, that film, which I like. Um, you get to the end there where Doomsday shows up. And Batman's entire part of the movie is like, I'm going to stay out of this one. <laughs> <laughs> although, although I have to say, that fight almost starts, I mean, well, it kind of starts with Batman whirling the bat plane around and shooting at Doomsday. And I'm watching that movie going, Batman has engaged Doomsday. This is the greatest movie ever. <laughs> you know, just little things like that. But, um, but once the actual fight happens, I mean, Wonder Woman is a literal god and Superman is very godlike. And they just start going, you know, toe to toe with this thing that's beating the crap out of them. Batman's going to go over there. I'm going to surveil the area. <laughs> yeah. Make I'll, sure uh, Joker's not sneaking up or something. I'll, I'll make sure uh, do a dog's wander. And, you know, uh, that's, a weird, that's a weird place. But that's, that's the kind of things you got to deal with when you're making up these universes and you have all these multiple characters well, sharing I mean, space. That's one of the things about Superman. Over the years, as he's been incorporated into a, a larger DC universe, they've had to significantly weaken him They've they've weakened him extensively, and they've been making up stuff. Um, like he apparently, he is no stronger than anybody else against magical uh, abilities. So they can bring in a magical supervillain, and it just completely negates Superman. I like that. Yeah, they introduce all kind of like um, like in the TV show Smallville when they introduce they bring in all these different kryptonites. It's like red kryptonite, blue kryptonite, and That's green kryptonite. Yeah, but like. It's like, man, you have to you have to literally come up with a MacGuffin to to allow you to tell a story because otherwise he would just solve the problem instantly with yes. no effort. Very true. It's always been his problem. In fact, um, you know, speaking of multiple writers, uh, Superman's strengths is solely dependent on who happens to be writing him at the time. Um, it seems, and at the same time, how good those stories are is very much up to the writer, because he is that powerful. How do you yeah. tell stories about that? Character? It's like, all right, we've made a burrito so hot that God can't touch it. Okay, now make him touch it. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, and you can you can see you can see how like different people approach the problem. Um, you look at the movie, like say Superman Returns, the Brian Singer film that he left X Men Three for, which he shouldn't have done because that movie was terrible. Um, he makes Superman Returns, and his entire approach is, we got to hurt his feelings. You watch that movie for over two. You watch that movie for over two hours, and Superman throws not one punch, not one punch, in that entire film. Uh, that film is boring. Uh, posturing, uh, take that. That's that's the movie. That's the movie. It's like Lex Luthor stands there, gives a monologue, and it throws a green rock at you. It's like, okay, sure, all right, whatever. And then you have the flip side. You have Zack Snyder's take on it, which is, I dare say the accurate take on it because he has to fight things that can punch him back. It is not pleasant for anyone within 50 feet. You know, that's a scary reality of that character. If you were going to actually explore that fact, anything, anything that is powerful enough to threaten Superman is a world ending threat. There's no way you get out of that with no casualties. You know, and that's, that's the scary reality of that character. Um, which is also why I really appreciate Batman because Batman is so ground level. His characters are kind of small scale. Um, same thing with Spider-Man. Uh, Spider-Man's characters are very much in the same way. They're very small scale, um, very grounded, more down to earth. He's not insanely powerful. Uh, that's kind of true for the entirety of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, except for the villains. It's like if somebody's really powerful, they're just a villain. Ultron is insane in the comics. The Ultron we got in the movies is just pfft, nothing nothing compared to the comics. I, this is not a joke. That is a time-traveling robot that Fs you up, all right? Um, yeah, so, I, I mean, you just, you just get these weird these weird things where 
I, I like the more grounded characters because I can believe in them. And then you get these really super crazy characters and I can really enjoy them. Like I love, you know, like V brought up to DC animated universe. I love that, that Superman. Um, that Superman starts out from the get go weaker and he stays weak um, in, a, in, a, in a contextual sense. Um, like if he gets shot by a bullet, the bullet's not going to hurt him, but it's going to knock him back. You know, whereas you go to the Brian Singer film where he takes a bullet to the eyeball and doesn't even flinch, right? Like that's very different. Um, so again, that's a writer's interpretation. It's a different setting. And then you've got you know other versions of characters that are like even more powerful than the ones that you're used to. Like say um, the Batman Returns version of Batman, who drives around in a tank, is just crazy powerful, punching people out, and he does he like what. Gotham City's getting overrun by mutants and he like goes and he fights the mutant leader and he punches him out in the mud and he goes, you're wrong, kid. This isn't a battlefield. It's an operating table. Crack! And I'm the surgeon. Oh, jeez. <laughs> and that, that, was, that was the model for the Batman that we got in Batman vs. Superman, mind you. That's why he's kind of... Um, that Batman's intense. Oh. So he's still not a crazy homeless guy kidnapping children. No, <laughs> no, he's not. No, he's not. No, he's not. That's good. That's really good. Yeah. And that's why, you know, like they, like people talk about like, you know, well, I like this character because of this. And it's like, yeah, but that's, that's one interpretation of the character. There's so many different versions of these characters. It's a little, it's a little insane to keep track of at this point. I mean, like, you know, my favorite version of Peter Parker was this ultimate version that, you know, was not part of the main continuity and got killed. You know, what am I supposed to do? I don't win. My favorite incarnation is Spider-Man Noir. That's a cool character, too. So badass. I like it. It's so brutally violent, too. <laughs> it is, it is. And that's he the gives thing, too. no Fs. And that's the thing, too. It's like, um, oh, what was it? Um, people were saying that the Marvel Universe was better than the DC Universe because the DC Universe was too dark and blah, blah, blah. And I was like... What? Well, no, no. Do you remember when, when Superman returned? No, not Superman. Wow. When Man of Steel came out, everyone got really pissy because half of Metropolis gets leveled, even though, you know, he saves the planet, but whatever. Um, part of Metropolis gets leveled and he has to kill Zod at the end. And everyone got really pissy about that because they're like, the Marvel Universe over there is being all happy and fun. And you guys are being all dark and depressing. And, um, and I was like, yeah, but you know, the way that they got away with that is that they ignore everything that's a negative about these characters we have never had a movie that dealt with the fact that in the comics tony was a destructive alcoholic like it was it was awful this story arc went on for years and years and years and years and it was it was just horrendous what this guy was going through and mind you before that movie even came out he was kind of a it was, it was damn near a c-lister like he was a b-list character who floating in popularity let's put it this way so i used to read this uh, action figure collecting uh magazine called toy fair i know that's that yeah and toy fair they, was funny. they had this comic book in there that they made with action figures uh called uh mega theater mm -hmm. and they constantly spider-man constantly because spider-man was the main character he constantly brought up and berated Iron Man for how drunk he was all the time. And Iron Man would, like, lean over. He was constantly, you know, all the time, if you saw Iron Man, he was in his suit, he had beers, and he would vomit out of his eye holes and mouth yeah, <laughs> because there's nowhere for it to go. <laughs> or, like, he would be sloshing in his urine inside the suit <laughs> from Aww. being on a binge. Like... Toy Fair was the only ones to acknowledge the horrible, deprecating status of a lot of the heroes. Yeah, and and like um, with Ant Man, this one to me is actually quite remarkable. Um, with Ant Man, they make the movie after Age of Ultron, so Hank Pym in the comics is the original creator of Ultron. So they they push that over to Iron Man, I guess to give stark more character development it works i actually i actually like it i'm not i'm not like complaining about that but i'm just saying the character is already being presented in a way that is not true to the character um and then they skip ahead and they jump to scott lang and they have the wasp die 
in a flashback and basically skip over the entire part where Hank Pym is a wife abuser. That's pretty much the extent of their relationship. He hits his wife. You know, that's what the comic says. And, you know, the movie, the movies just, they, they water these characters down so hard to this sort of like, just, yep. They this idolize them. Great. You know, yeah, totally. And I'm okay with that. I really like these movies, but I'm just saying when people make that comparison and they start complaining about how the DC versus, I'm just like, yeah, but you're also watching a, you're watching a focus group tested version of the character. I, that's the only way I can put it. I mean, like, I'm enjoying the character. You're enjoying the character. Everyone's enjoying the character because they tested the character and the character's enjoyable. It's not actually the character that was in the comics. Deadpool is the only comic book movie we've got the actual oh, God. comic book version of the character. Yes. Sure. Yes, we did. We, straight Thank up. you, Ryan Reynolds, for fighting so hard to get a true representation. Yeah, we got we got exactly what was coming to us. <laughs> <laughs> In every way. That character that character is crude, force wall breaking, and ridiculous. Um, but you know, I mean, as much as I'm kinda like slamming a lot of this stuff, I I love these shared universes. I think they're really fun. And there's so many of them, you know. Um and they also allow for really cool stuff to happen. Um do either of you guys know about the sentry in the Marvel comics? No, not on me. James, do you know about the Sentry? Um, I might, but you'd have to start okay. talking about it. Okay, all right. Um, <clears throat> Sentry is one of those things where a shared universe shines. So one of the things about the Marvel cinema... No, wow, see, too many universes. One of the things about the Marvel Comics universe is it doesn't have a Superman. Right. Every character is very grounded. I mean, you start talking about, like, what's what's the most powerful characters? And you start going, eh, Thor is kind of out there. He's kind of ridiculous. Yeah. And then you're like, you're you... like but, but Thor can get punched out. Yeah. yeah. Thor, Thor's most powerful is, I would say, in God Butcher. Like, he is literally called the God of Gods. Like, he becomes the most powerful thing to ever exist. Yeah. And that's, you know, but... not... That's not it's the comic universe. No, no, it's temporary. Yeah, I know. That's why I said it's not. It's not the comic universe. It's not just. This is not. It's not his standard setting, right? He's. He is. Well, it's like there was a cosmic Spider-Man at one point. Yep. You know, he became but that's like, God. Yeah, but that's not. That's not. That's not who the character is. It's a temporary thing. Um, and Thor, as powerful as Thor is, Thor can get punched out by the Hulk. And this is where it gets interesting if you're Marvel. The more powerful the characters become, there's one of two things that happens. Either the character is the villain, because that's interesting, because if the most powerful people are the villains, and that makes it hard for your heroes, or there's something wrong with your power. Case in point, Hulk. Hulk loses his control. Hulk, you basically point in a direction and hope he hits the right person. Like That's, that's literally what you're doing. And once again, you go to the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the Hulk is kind of like, I'm angry all the time. Hulk, smash, I will do that. It's like, and you know, <laughs> there was also, there is a version of the Hulk where he, through old age, just becomes the Hulk with Bruce Banner's intelligence and becomes the maestro who is evil. Yeah, that's true. Um, or you can go into Ultimate Hulk, who is a raging rapist and eats people. Yeah, they're yeah they explore the fact that there are multiple versions of the Hulk according to how powerful the emotion, co- like what what presiding emotion causes a transformation. And there is a nihilistic Hulk that tells Bruce Banner that if he ever gains control, he will murder everything he loves. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, but anyways, so Hulk Hulk is really powerful, but Hulk has these problems. So they just never allow themselves to go into like Superman levels of power. Uh, somebody decides that, you know what? Wouldn't it be interesting if Marvel Universe actually did, like during the golden age of like the 60s and 70s, have a Superman? So they create this character called Sentry. And you learn that the Sentry um, is like just the most awesome guy ever. He can calm down the Hulk... He's 
Peter Parker's best bud. Peter is actually successful and has money and all this kind of stuff. And just everywhere the Sentry goes, it's perfect. He is so powerful. He's just as smart as Reed Richards. He can just smack down anything. He can stop alien invasions. He's uber. He is Superman, effectively. He's just crazy, crazy awesome. The problem is there's this villain who's just as strong, and he's called The Void. And the void keeps showing up where he goes to right wrongs and the void keeps fighting him and all this kind of stuff and blah, 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 blah. Things go forward. And then at one point, the the century realizes he is the void. He is so good that it creates an opposing opposite to himself. And the void is just as powerful. And the only way to defeat the void is to stop being the century. But he can't be the century. He can't stop being the century. People know he's the century. So he wipes out everybody's memory and effectively he wipes himself out of comic book continuity. So somebody in the early 2000s writes a book about a character in the 70s who wiped himself out of the continuity. It is super awesome. And then Ben just screwed it up by bringing him back for the new Avengers arc, but whatever. Because again, multiple writers have different agendas. So you get, you get, you get cool stuff and then people screw it up later and you just kind of got to enjoy it while it lasts because just, it just goes. Like 616 and Ultimate, they got crushed together. And yeah. I miss you, Peter. It makes me sad. I miss you, Peter. I miss you so much. That was great. Uh, but yeah, and then there are other shared universes um, that you don't realize are shared universes um, until it's too late, and you're like, oh, crap, and i got to read all these books. Um, one of my favorite novels is the Mistborn trilogy by Brandon Sanderson. It's amazing. I'm not going to get into it. It's that good. I kind of wanted to do an episode on the Mistborn trilogy, but then I realized that doing that would just like ruin all the joy of it for everybody. So just go read these books because they're incredible, please. Um, here's the thing. I'm reading these books and I noticed that there's, there's some really weird stuff happening around the characters that doesn't make any sense. And it's not really drawn attention to, um, or when they're dealing with important characters and they're kind of acting a little weird. It's kind of like the, the characters in the book are like, this, this seems odd. Something is off about this. I don't understand what's not right. Um, you later find out that Brandon Sanderson, every single book he's writing is part of what he calls the Cosmere. And they are a bunch of different worlds that share a point of origin. And there are a bunch of characters called world hoppers who can travel between the different worlds. And they're basically building up to a giant mega story arc at some point. The guy may as well hold up a sign that says, I play Magic the Gathering. All right. The main characters are planeswalkers who are running around in the background of your stories. <laughs> And I did not realize this until um, he started writing a sequel series called The Alloy of Law. And again, really awesome. Um, one of the things I will say about um, the Mistborn series is why it is so cool is the planet is called Scadriel. And basically, Brandon Sanderson explores one of the things that I hate about fantasy, which is the 10,000 years and nothing has changed. We have magic, so we never evolve. Oh, you know, 10,000 years ago, crap happened, and then the elves just chilled and did nothing. Uh, so what he does is he creates this world of Scadriel, and it starts out in a sort of old Victorian-esque setting uh, with the magic and stuff. But then it's going to evolve in the second book series, this one that I'm reading right now, The Alloy of Law, um, they've, they've evolved to electricity and trains and guns, but the magic system is still there and in place. There will be another trilogy later that is more contemporary modern day that will involve a SWAT team that still deals all the magical crap. And then there will be another series that involves magically assisted FTL travel in their giant spaceships. Because why should technology stop just because there's magic? Because Warhammer. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyways... So I'm reading the one, I'm reading Alloy of Law, and at the back of Alloy of Law, there is a listing of all the different magical systems and how they work and all the different metals that make up the magics. It's a complicated thing. Um, but there's a part at the end, it's a few paragraphs of notes that a character has compiled, and then the character starts talking about how this world's magical abilities are interesting. This is neat, and if there's anything that can help out the Cosmere, it would be this. And I'm like, what's the Cosmere? And then I go look it up, and damn it, now I have to buy a bunch of other books. Yeah, so he's basically telling multiple stories simultaneously on completely different worlds 
that all share the same point of origin and are all going to lead towards a singular conclusion. That's awesome. It's a great shared universe. And um, just as an aside, just to give people an idea as to why I love Mistborn, um, I won't say anything about the plot. I'll just explain a little bit about the magical system. The magical system is based on metals. And um, in Scadrial, it's just the way that it works is you take dust, like you take metal, you grind it into dust, and then you eat it. And if you're what they, if you're one of these people that can burn metals, as they call it, you can um, choose to burn the metal that's in your in your stomach, and this gives you abilities. So like if you burn pewter, you become incredibly strong. Like you become the Hulk. You don't Hulk out. You just you're really really strong, and you just you can just punch through a brick wall because you're just insane. Um, if you take other metals, then you get different powers, and you can do just really really neat stuff. It's so much fun. Really, please read it. It's great. But here's the funny thing. There's this metal called aluminum. And in the Mistborn trilogy, when you burn aluminum, aluminum's power is that it burns out all of your other metals so that they're gone. Because there are other people that can burn metals to detect if you have metals in you. And if you don't want them to do that, you can burn aluminum, make it go away. Now, some people can't burn all the metals. They can only burn certain metals. And so if your ability is that you can burn aluminum, you're pretty much useless. They're like, oh, you're an aluminum gnat. Good job. So aluminum is a giant joke, other than the fact that you can burn it out to get rid of your other metals, which maybe you don't want to do, because some of the other metals are really expensive. Like the one that lets you see two seconds into the future, that one's really expensive. You don't want to accidentally burn that one out. Um, so you've got this aluminum, it's a joke, whatever. Pfft, stupid, stupid metal. And there are other people called coin shots, and what they can do is they can burn another metal, I can't remember which, but it lets them push and pull on other metals. So they're called coin shots because they can flick a coin into the air and then push it through you like a bullet. And then other people can pull it back to themselves. It's crazy. Um, you can't do that with aluminum. If there's aluminum metals, you can't push or pull on them. So they're useless to the coin shots. Coin shots don't care. They're like, whatever, this is stupid. Fast forward to the future where now we have trains and electricity and stuff. You know what one of the most expensive metals is? Aluminum. Why is aluminum awesome? Because if you make your guns and your bullets have aluminum, coin shots can't push it. That's awesome. It's like how times change. So that's that's some good stuff. You guys, if you haven't read that or anybody listening hasn't read that, please fix yourself. Get on board this train. It's amazing. Um, and then it becomes part of the Cosmere, which I haven't read any of those other books yet, but I feel I'm going to have to at some point because I can see where it's going. Uh, yeah, so I mean, just multiverses in general, um, shared universes, I mean, I I really enjoy them. They allow for some really cool stuff. They also allow for some bad stuff, depending on the writer. Um, it's always a real shame when somebody writes something that you're really, really into, and then somebody else comes in and just wrecks the whole thing. That sucks. Um, but, you know, for the most part, I think they're worth it. It'll be interesting to see where some of these go. I mean, the DC universe has just really started getting going. Wonder Woman was good. Um, and I, know, I actually think we're going to get something really great with Justice League. Um, I, I think with um, what's actually been happening here is people haven't probably noticed, or at least some haven't noticed, it's more like a three-part act. Like, first, you have Man of Steel, introduction to Superman, yay. Then you have Batman v Superman, which is like the dark, the sort of like the dark um, center chapter, which tends to happen, right? You know, the stakes get raised, bad things happen. It's no secret he's going to come back to life. Okay, that's just not a secret. If you know about the comic books, if you know about the Death of Superman arc, if you've seen the promotional posters for Justice League, Superman's coming back. And when he does, I think it's going to be awesome. I think it's going to justify all of the crap these characters have gone through. Because you can actually see it at the very end of BV Batman vs. Superman, where Batman realizes, oh crap, I failed Jesus. And effectively just... You look at him in the Justice League trailers, he has a brighter outlook on life. Like, he's he's been reinvigorated. Like, he was really cynical because he's been fighting crime for 20 years and getting nothing for it. And Superman was awesome, and he screwed that up. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to do better. So I think Justice League will be good. We'll see. We'll, see. we'll know in November. I, I, have, I have hope, though. I have hope. But then again, I'm also a Zack Snyder fan, so that puts me in a weird minority. <laughs> but yeah, so it's kind of what I wanted to talk about. Um, actually, no... There are the Crisis reboots. Like, you were talking about DC and, like, um, not DC, uh, Star Wars. 
I'm like they just rebooted it out. Yeah, DC keeps doing this thing where they keep they keep going. Uh, it got weird. Um, Crisis on Infinite Earths. Uh, kill all the characters we don't like, and the characters that survive are the ones whose continuities we want to keep going forward with. So you're on like your third or fourth different version of Wonder Woman and Superman and Batman at this point. Doesn't who cares? My favorite uh, multiverse murdering spree would be the Sp- <laughs> Spider Verse. I love Spider Verse. So Spider Man died. Spider Verse is great. I mean, and it's... we got Spider Gwen, which is hella awesome. Oh, and then they ruined her her universe. Not her character, but her universe. I feel it's it's turning into a uh, a platform for cheap shots. Oh boy, yay! Well, did you did you see they did um, and this is the thing. Like, I hate this kind of stuff because it dates things and it and it just shows that somebody has an agenda they just can't let go of. Um, but there's a Modok machine only designed for killing or whatever it's called. And Modok's a pretty hardcore villain in the Marvel Universe. And in the Gwen Spider Universe, Modok is Donald Trump. Okay. That, that, that's, really? That's, that's, yeah, that's not even clever. It's like, yeah, Modok is Trump. And now I'm, I guess I'm supposed to laugh and be like, oh, I get that. But Donald Trump's the villain. Yay. That's weak. That, it's that's seriously even, weak. That, that fruit's hanging so low, it's just laying on the ground. That's what I mean. Like it, it ruins everything because now I can't, I, I can't even look at that as a straight face. I'm like this, this, like somebody's gonna just walk into this universe at any point and just crack a joke, and I'm just gonna walk out. Like it, it's like that. That wasn't even clever. It's just lame, and it, it dates the whole thing, and it, it's, and also you know for everybody else out there, it assumes you agree. That's the thing I always love about that kind of stuff. It's like I'm gonna make a blatantly political statement. It's like eh, way to piss off half your audience. Just throwing that out there. But yeah, that that kind of stuff. But no, I love Spider-Gwen. I think that's great that we got that. Oh, Spider-Verse is just cool. I mean, I, I, I bought that. I have the hardcover of that. It was so good. Look, I got to see the confirmation of freaking Japanese Spider-Man. Yes. <laughs> that's all I care about. And Leo Pardon. And Black and white comic strip Spider-Man, too. The spiritual <laughs> grandfather of the Megazord. Like, I was happy. Yeah, that no. Yeah, the emissary it, it, of hell arrived and summoned his Megazord. Oh, it was great. Yeah, Spider Spider Verse is one of those things where like you're reading it and it's just pure joy. I mean, yeah, you're you're watching a lot of different Spider-Man characters just get absolutely wrecked by interdimensional vampires, but it's still fun even when they're dying because it's like where there's yet, that one Spider-Man. There's that there's that Spider-Man who uh, they used him to sell candies. I can't remember which one. He was like in, in candy commercials. And he would always like solve his problem, like, throw the candy bar at people, and they'd get happy. And the vampire comes after him. He's like throwing the candy bars. The vampire's like, "Why aren't you happy?" <laughs> then he dies. <laughs> so weird. And yet, they didn't take a chance to kill off Spider Side. God, <laughs> Spider Side was the worst. Nineties? Why? Why did you have to be all about radical edge lords? It's like, hey, we're gonna make a Spider Man who's bu- who could Hulk out. No joke, Hulk out and grow blades out of his arms because 90s, they didn't even take an opportunity to murder Spider-Side. I blame you, Todd McFarlane. <laughs> you and your Spawn comic. Yeah, seriously, he ruined the 90s of comics. <laughs> I know. <laughs> his artwork was great, but man. Oh, was it? I, I can't remember who, who the quotes attributed to. But it was like, the 90s was the time when Venom got his own comic book and Superman died. Remember that. It's like, yeah, that sums it up. Oh man. Yeah, no. Yeah, good stuff. Um V, any uh any thoughts, opinions? Bring universes that you like or anything else to just I, I can't think of anything else to say really. My appeal for shared universes is the connection that you make as a consumer is a way of putting it. Um I mentioned earlier that you know, the connections or the links between say, you know, one comic book or another or one TV show and another, it's either on a big scale. So, you know, a well-known character walks onto the set of the your current show and you go, oh, there's, that's my guy. I like him a lot. And you brought in, you make the connection, you enjoy, the, enjoy you know, you enjoy seeing the fact that, you know, your favorite characters from two different shows or two different movies are on the same screen. And then there's the, the subtle connection. And this is more like uh, your Easter eggs, I guess, is the way to mm. Toy Story. Them. 
or the Pixar universe. Pixar universe does it. Um, even just yeah. subtle things like um, we were talking Piano. about the the Netflix uh, Marvel universe, where it'll just be something like a newspaper article stuck to the the pin board, or a character walking past on the screen on the streets. And if you are paying attention, if you're clued to the fact, you pick up on it, and it makes you sort of feel smart. Sort of like, ha, I got it. There's that connection and there's this is the link. And it's sort of, you know, it's throwing it out there for, yeah, you know, it's sort of like a test of the, are you a real fan? And, and you see the Pixar universe does, does a great job of that. There's always a link to a previous film, a previous character in every, every movie that they do. And we, we, and we, have stayed mostly in the comic book realm. We didn't even go into something like the Warner Brothers universe of animation, where you got Animaniacs, which takes place in Hollywood, which represents oh, yeah. Hollywood actors. And then you got the Looney Tunes, which yeah. appear in Space Jam, which has Michael Jordan and Larry Bird, which means that it's crossed over into reality because it's actually Michael Jordan as himself. And I saw him play for the Birmingham Barons, which means I'm a part of that universe as a background character. Sure. That gets weird, man. (laughs) (laughs) No, you know what? You know, it actually is to me like one of the, one of the other fun things that shared universes do when they're not actually shared, they just make references to one another. Um, And I think my favorite version of this, um, I had to have this explained to me because I don't actually watch the other show, but I did notice something very weird. Um, There's an episode of Rick and Morty. Um, oh my God! There's an episode of Rick and Morty where um, it, it's called Big Trouble in Little Sanchez, um, and they they pop a whole bunch of portals open, and as they're popping open the portals, some trash flies out of one of them. A pad with a pen and a cup with a uh, a coffee mug with a question mark on it. Right, exactly. And then you find out later this is from. Gravity show, Falls. Yeah, a show called Gravity Falls. <laughs> One of Disney's character. greatest shows. Yeah, where a character a character throws those things into a green portal, similar to how Rick and Morty make portals. And then in that Rick and Morty episode, those items fall out of the portal. Well, it actually goes deeper than that. Um, they really know each other. Well, there's a, there's a lot of actual background references of them crossing over, and the the creators have directly mentioned that they are in the same universe like as it went on like it'd be like uh so there's like a reference in gravity falls to a talking couch and then rick and morty go to a universe where furniture is alive and that yes. couch is in the background as a homeless couch mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. yeah it like yeah. it goes on and on <laughs> like okay. it's deeper than just that one reference it goes through the entire show that's hilarious. I didn't know that. I knew about that one scene because, like I said, I saw the trash come out of that portal. I was like, "What?" Well, yeah, there, there's a a straight up character in um, Gravity Falls that the creators like because they're friends. The creators of Rick and Morty are friends with the creators of Gravity Falls that they were going to put in Rick and Morty, but they never got around to it. But like, there's all kinds of references. Like, it's the same universe. Yeah, which is hilarious because Disney. <laughs> Yeah, Rick and Morty is as far away from Disney as you can get. No kidding. True. True, true. And yet, and yet these things. Yeah. So I mean, sometimes that stuff happens, and it's just glorious. It's just it's just a joy to see that kind of stuff occur. Um, yeah, that's that's fun. Yeah. So I mean, shared universes are are an interesting place because you you get to have really fun things go down, and like I said, I love them because they're so vast and expansive and crazy stuff can happen. And you have, like you said, you, you form attachments to characters. Like I love it when Superman, you know, and Batman get together, no matter where it is. I've always enjoyed it. Like world's finest three-parter in the animated series. Ah, it's the greatest thing ever. Or like when Su- Superman dresses up as Batman and just one punches out Bane and Bane. Yeah. Like, Rex, <laughs> the Bane, Rex Bane shows up. I am confused. Exactly- talks exactly in the voice of uh bruce wayne like as as batman and then robin's like uh what is going on he's like oh i can just control my my throat muscles however i want i can make my voice sound like anybody it's like oh my god yeah precise muscle control and he's like don't do that again 
<laughs> yeah, no, it's it's great. It's great. And like I I love that stuff. I think that stuff is fantastic. What I do like is when you start seeing people put their own personal agendas through it and just destroy everything around them for the sake of their own personal agenda. Um, it gets frustrating. You know, it gets really, really frustrating to watch continuity snarls occur, to watch weird stuff happen. One of my favorite continuity snarls, for example, was um, in Marvel Comics proper, the Green Goblin got ousted as Norman Osborn to the public in two different ways simultaneously in two different books. Like, somebody screwed up hard <laughs> with the editing. Because at one point, um, Peter unmasks him, and then everyone's like, oh my god, the Green Goblin's Norman Osborn. And then elsewhere, um, Norman Osborn threatens Luke Cage's wife, Jessica Jones, and her baby, and he grabs Norman Osborn's car and just smashes it, and the Green Goblin comes flying out of it, and it's like, Norman Osborn's the Green Goblin. I'm like, yeah, somebody screwed up. <laughs> Like, these books literally came out in the, in the same months. Like, somebody just completely whiffed. Um, yeah, so weird weird things like that happen, and it's just strange. Yeah, it's kind of like with, um, uh, what's his name? Si- Quicksilver? Quicksilver in Civil War and Quicksilver in X-Men. Oh, they traded. They totally traded. One of them got Quicksilver, the other one got Scarlet Witch. I know they traded. No, no, no. I mean, they, they killed off Quicksilver in... Uh, Age, not Age of Ultron. It was, uh, yeah, it was the Avengers. Yeah, okay, yeah. They killed off Quicksilver, but at the same time, in theaters, you could go watch the X-Men version of Quicksilver, who is arguably the cooler one. Right, and they're also not in a shared universe, which is awkward also, because X-Men is having problems. Oh, and you were talking about Fantastic Four. Disney's burning the X-Men bridge, too. Yeah, they are. They're yeah, moving they, they, from all merchandise. Yeah, it's getting really weird over there. But yeah, no, that's why I meant like I think they traded because there was a there was a uh, a legal snarl there because Quicksilver and Scarlet Witch are both Avengers properties and X Men, and they couldn't resolve it, so they were just like, okay, you can have Quicksilver, we'll kill ours, and we'll keep Scarlet Witch. Okay, I'm pretty sure that's what happened. But yeah, that was a weird time because you could go see both those movies, and it was like, okay, so in this two different time, versions of the same person. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and, you know, it's like, it gets weird, and that's why this might actually be one of the harder episodes to follow. Imagine trying to follow this crap in real life, people. It gets upsetting. Yeah, like I said, I'm, I'm done, and if I, I could go about this forever, so. Yep, we're good. <laughs> All right, if you'd like to send your uh, death threats and racist rants at Robert, you can find his email. <laughs> Bring it, I'm good. He supports the patriarchy and the alt-right. We all know it. Lies, fabrications. <laughs> this has been episode two ten. If you can't tell, I'm sleepy. Two eleven. Two eleven. Crap! No, I'm real. I'm so tired. You did it's it like, anyway. We like had a whole one, conversation about this. You did it anyway. It's it's like one a.m. here. <laughs> What's our next episode? Uh, James, it's about sleep deprivation. <laughs> I'll have to figure that one out. <laughs> Let's just swing out of here. Sing in Spider-Man. <laughs> Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Does whatever a spider can. No, man. So it's like... Any size. Catch his sleeves. Just like... Spider blood. Spider blood. Radioactive spider blood. Spider blood. Stop. Stop. <laughs> I Bye, hate guys. you. Bye-bye. <laughs>Here we go. What? Wait, before I start, yep, this on. is episode. I can tell you here in a second. Two, ten. That's what I thought. Two ten. No, sorry, we're two eleven. All right, this won't be the third time that we've made two ten. <laughs> yeah, we're two eleven. Maybe it just should become a running gag. Every episode is two ten. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're trapped. This is our fourth year trapped in the time lapse. <laughs> <laughs>